Hello there, you beautiful people. My name is Willow, and today we're going to be finding out if I can beat Fallout 4 survival difficulty with only pipe weapons. Before we get into the run, let's lay down some ground rules. I can only use pipe weapons to cause damage. This includes bashing with pipe weapons. I must play the entire game on the survival difficulty. I can't use any bugs or glitches on purpose to exploit the game. I can only use visual mods, which will be shown on screen now, and I cannot use console commands for anything but fixing bugs. With the rules of the run laid out, let's take a look at the challenge itself. I have seen this challenge done by a few other channels that I really enjoy, but I always felt like playing on lower difficulties was a bit disappointing, so I figured I'd do it myself on the hardest difficulty. I'm writing this script as I go, and all of this part has been written before beginning the run. If you want to get past my starting thoughts and get right into the gameplay, skip to the timecode on screen. Now that they're gone, let's dump some info! What's so different about survival? Well, quite a bit actually. For starters, the only way to save is by sleeping. You can no longer fast travel, your character needs to eat, drink, and sleep in order to avoid negative effects or in extreme cases stay alive. Enemies no longer appear on the compass. All healing items now heal over time instead of instantly, including rad healing items. Ammunition now has weight. I could keep going, but I think you get the picture. The big thing for us that may make this challenge easier on this difficulty is that combat damage has been increased for both us and the enemies as well as health reduced on both sides. So maybe the pipe weapons won't be so bad. Speaking of the pipe weapons, let's take a look at them. In Fallout 4, we have three delicious flavors of pipes to choose from. Pipe guns, bolt action pipe guns, and pipe revolvers. The good old basic pipe gun is the most versatile by far. Able to be both semi and fully automatic and capable of using both 38 and 45 caliber rounds, I think this will be the best choice if we want something to be an all-rounder style of weapon. The bolt action pipe gun is less versatile in its firing speed, but can be a powerful one-shot weapon able to use 38, 308, and 50 caliber rounds. I think this could be our best bet if we want to try and go with a sniper build. And then we have the pipe revolver, which is the middle ground between these two. Having a semi-auto firing cycle, which is faster than the bolt action, but still having access to the ammo types of the bolt action, I think this might be the goldlock zone of usefulness for survival, and I'm hoping to find one early on. With everything covered, let's get into the run. Overall, I think I can beat the game, but I'll have to take it slow. We start off with character creation in our pre-war bathroom, which is fitting, because our character looks like something you'd find in a toilet. After that, we leave the bathroom, chug some coffee, make annoying remarks at everything in the house until an annoying man rings our doorbell. He's from vault Tech, and no matter how hard you try to tell him to go away, he will get your information. Go. Away. I guess they didn't invent Facebook in the Fallout timeline, so data mining people is much more intrusive. Oh well. Here we get to name our glorious character and pick our special stats. I'm not going to go over these stats now as I ended up changing them a bit later. So moving on, after he leaves we have to go check on our son because the robot with a flamethrower and saw blade couldn't seem to keep him from crying. Quite strange. Either way, while we're blowing off our wife's attempts at family time. After breakfast, I was thinking we could head to the park for a bit. Weather should hold up. And miss the World Series? Not gonna happen. We get called into the living room by our robo butler to find out that the 4th of July fireworks are getting a little out of hand. This scares us so much that we run down the street, up a hill, past a couple of dudes with miniguns and power armor, and onto a big metal platform that starts lowering us down into the vault. Unfortunately though, it is too slow and everyone on the platform dies and that's the end of our run. Okay, no, but I can't be the only one calling BS on these people living, right? Gotta give me some give and take. Either way, we we go into the vault, get turned into a popsicle, watch a kidnapping and a murder, double whammy, then wake up and finally start the challenge. So our first obstacle is rough. There are a ton of rad roaches in the vault and we can't attack them at all. After spending some time trapping them in various rooms and totally not dying because I forgot that this door only works with a terminal, we managed to get out of the vault relatively unscathed. When leaving the vault, we are prompted if we want to change our name or special stats. I wasn't sure what I wanted when I started the run, so I decided to change the build. I went with 3 strength to get the armorer perk later on, 2 perception for rifleman, 3 endurance for life giver, 3 charisma for 
Lone Wanderer, 5 Intelligence for Experience Boosts and Scrapper, 5 Agility for Action Boy, and 7 Luck for Critical Banker. Overall, I want this build to work well with the VAT system, which slows down the game and has the player take an automated aimed shot. The only thing I'm worried about is the low perception making our VAT's accuracy bad, but I think we can get more perception pretty early on, so hopefully it won't be an issue. After exiting the vault, I immediately ran to the bridge leading out of Sanctuary. On the far side of the bridge, we find a dead drifter and a dead mongrel. We get our hands on a pipe pistol from the dead drifter, and near him, next to a statue, we find a duffel bag with a pipe revolver rifle inside. Finally armed and able to fight, I go back to the distraught Codsworth, our pre-war robo butler, and listen to him complain about cleaning. I spent the first ten years trying to keep the floors waxed before clearing out some bloat flies from Sanctuary with him and upgrading our pipe pistol into a pipe rifle after setting up a water purifier and generator. A big part of this run will be gaining and maintaining a stock of purified water as it's the best way to heal without incurring negative effects. And it is necessary to avoid dying of thirst. Oh, if you're playing survival yourself, make sure to always pick up empty bottles. They can be used at water pumps to get free purified water. Now that we've prepared a little bit and even leveled up to boot, taking the Lone Wanderer perk which increases our carry weight and lowers damage taken as long as we don't have a humanoid companion, we can finally head out of Sanctuary and work on finding our son Sean. I don't think I ever mentioned this, but the baby that was kidnapped in the earlier cutscene, yeah, that's our son and his name is Sean. And our first stop on the road to saving him is the Red Rocket truck stop where we find everyone's favorite doggo and kill some mole rats. I also stopped up here to set up another water purifier and generator. From here on out, I won't talk too much about settlement management because it's kind of boring, but just know that building up these water purifiers are important if you try survival mode yourself. Moving on from the Red Rocket, we make our way to Concord, a local city Codsworth told us about, and we find quite the strange scene. There's a siege going on between some raiders and a man dressed up like an American revolutionary on the balcony of a museum. We rush in and put the raiders to sleep with a lullaby about pipes before being told to grab some useless laser stick and ask to come inside to help more raiders with their insomnia. Hey, up here, on the balcony, I've got a group of settlers inside. The raiders are almost through the door. Grab that laser musket and help us, please! The fight isn't too hard, just requiring us to take it slow, but eventually we cure the raiders of their restlessness and save the silly man dressed in old-timey clothes. He tells us about a suit of power armor on the roof, which sounds like fun, and we make sure to grab the perception bobblehead from the desk in this room. Before we head outside to grab the power armor, I noticed that we leveled up twice during all the fighting, and I decided to take the perks Rifleman and Critical Banker, allowing us to store criticals in vets and raising our damage with rifles. Anyways, we head outside to grab the power armor and confront more raiders, but I kind of just end up watching this raider slowly jump off a building, and I found it really funny, so here's that. And after that happened, we continued to mow down some more of his buddies when, surprise, a Deathclaw attacks. We fight it, or maybe fight is the wrong word? We cheese it really, really hard because Deathclaws are way too thick with two Cs to fit through doors. With that complete, we use what's left of the fusion core powering our armor to run up to the red rocket and stash a lot of the gear that we got. I decided to run back and forth stashing as much as I can to sell later. These fights really showed me that I'm going to need much, much more ammo than I originally thought. So my plan now is to grab as much stuff as possible to trade for ammo. After stashing all this loot, I run back up to the museum to talk to the funny looking man once again. Turns out his name is Preston Garvey and he is the last remaining member of a faction called the Minutemen. So he is a Minuteman. And this convo was just really weird and made me laugh because Preston kept interrupting himself with his own lines and then there were these odd pauses in dialogue. It was like someone trying to figure out how conversations work in real time. Yeah, for a while anyway. We can at least move some. Listen. When we first met, you asked about the Minutemen. One thing I just saw you go toe to toe with a 20 foot tall irradiated lizard. You telling me you can't keep an open mind after that? 
It's all right. Either way, Preston and the gang are heading back to Sanctuary, and I decided to explore a bit. I was going down the road south of Concord when I found our first merchant named Trashcan Carla. After flirting with her, just looking for love, sweetheart. We do some trading, selling off a bunch of the loot we just got for ammo and caps. I begin walking away from her when we got a random encounter with the scribe, a trader who sells armor, so uh, I just do the same thing with him. This has been super lucky and we now have a lot of caps and ammo to spare. After meeting Trashcan Carla and the scribe, I come across a diner where a drug dealer named Wolfgang and a merchant named Trudy are arguing about Trudy's son owing caps to Wolfgang. I agree to resolve the situation and get really lucky as I manage to pass a speech tech to convince Trudy to give Wolfgang the caps and now we have access to two more traders and honestly I wasn't expecting to have so many traders available to me so early so I spend a bit of time bartering and we end up with hundreds of rounds of ammo and all three types of pipe gun. At this point I realize I made a rookie mistake and forgot to get something important back at Sanctuary. So we head back there and I go into our old pre-war house and find the Your Special book, which lets us pick one of our special stats to raise by one. I decided to raise perception, meaning that we went from two perception to four already. Also, we leveled up and I was a bit torn on what perk to take. I know that I'm going to need Gun Nut, but I also want to get Scrapper as well. I decided to get Scrapper so I can go ahead and break down a ton of weapons to get the materials ready for when we get gun nut to upgrade our pipe guns. All right, so we've managed to gear up quite well, and I'm feeling it's time to head towards Diamond City, a major settlement that the Minutemen told us about. I grab a bunch of gear from the Red Rocket to use for bartering with any traders we find, and head south. After a bit of traveling, I picked up a radio station that seemed to be a distress call asking for help at Cambridge Police Station. I made my way there, dispatching a few feral ghouls on the way, to find a man in power armor and two others with him fighting ghouls themselves. I helped them dispatch the ghouls and talk to the man in power armor named Paladin Dance of the Brotherhood of Steel. I guess the scribe we met earlier was also a member as he has the same clothing as one of the two people with Dance. He asked for my help in retrieving some piece of technology from Arcjet Systems and I figured it'd be a good way to gain a level or two so after heading inside the police station, stashing my loot, and taking the gun nut perk since we leveled up fighting the ghouls, I told Dance we're good to go. We then follow him along the road to Arcjet, killing some raiders, bloatflies, and mongrels until Dance gets stuck in an extremely slow walking animation. After taking an extra like four minutes for Dance's leisurely stroll of sadness, we make our way into Arcjet Systems where we find a ton of Institute synths. I was paranoid of dying as I would have to do the entire walk to Arcjet again since the last time I slept was at the police station. So I let Dance do most of the fighting and supported him when it felt safe. Eventually we make it to a rocket engine test room and I have to turn the power back on to use the elevator. I eventually get the power back on but then a ton of synths spawn in the rocket room and like any self-respecting rocket enthusiast I press the big red launch button and dance got the world's fastest suntan. Moving on we make our way up the elevator and into the control room where we find yet again more synths and after killing them we find the technology that dance wants and somehow I lost dog meat like I have no idea where he went oh well we exit Arcjet and dance rewards us with a special laser rifle well at least it'll sell for a pretty penny after that I decided to head back to the red rocket to upgrade my pipe guns and see if dog meat was back there for some reason and luckily enough he was I also leveled up when we completed the Arcjet quest and took the perk toughness to get 10 free damage resist we then ran over to sanctuary to finish up the quest with the Minutemen and quickly did the Sanctuary quests from Sturges to build up Sanctuary for the quick XP. So, uh, we left for Diamond City and ended up right back where we started, huh? Well, on the bright side, we finished those quests and leveled up yet again, so I was able to take the Action Boy perk to give faster AP regeneration. That should help a lot with Vats. Speaking of which, I have found Vats to be extremely useful so far, really making a lot of these engagements a 
lot easier. Okay, back to progressing the story. We gotta head to Diamond City, so I set off south once again, and this time with better upgraded pipe guns and more ammo than before, we spend a while heading south, running into some encounters that weren't worth talking about, until eventually we cross a bridge and come across a firefight between some super mutants and some Diamond City security guards. Well, that's good news, we're at least close to Diamond City. After helping the guards defeat the super mutants and looting them, we make our way to the front gate of Diamond City only to find it closed with a reporter named Piper arguing with a man named Danny over the intercom saying, let me in. After helping her trick him into opening the gate, What, what's that? You said you're a trader up from Quincy? You have enough supplies to keep the general store stocked for a whole month? <laughs> you hear that, Danny? You gonna open the gate and let us in, or are you gonna be the one talking to crazy Myrna about losing out on all the supply? We head inside and find Valentine's detective agency where his assistant tells us that he's gone missing and to go look for him at some subway station with a vault in it. I never really thought of how inconvenient the story of Fallout 4 is until now. Like, nothing is just like, hey, the person or thing you need happens to be here. You just need to go out and get it where it needs to go. It's always some oddly specific scenario. Oh well, ramblings aside, I stock up with the traders and get an amazing new armor piece from the general store called the Wastelander's chest piece before leveling up and taking rank 2 of the rifleman perk. Now it's time to head out and find the missing detective. So we head off towards the subway station moving very slowly as the city is crawling with enemies. Seriously, there's just constant firefights going on. Eventually though, we do make it to the subway and begin fighting our way through a group of raiders called the Triggermen who dress up like old mob Mafia members while toting around Thompson submachine guns and 10mm pistols. Quite the get up honestly, I really like the flair they have, and we slog through them going from cover to cover and using vats a ton until we finally reach the entrance to the vault. We also leveled up during all of the combat so I took rank 2 of the toughness perk for more damage resist, and with that we're getting pretty tanky but we still blow through ammo with our low damage output relatively quickly. I know it may seem like having over a thousand rounds of ammo would last a long time, but right now I'm worried about ammo moving forward. I think we may need to go try and farm up a legendary pipe pistol somewhere, but we'll see. Either way, where were we? Oh right, we just entered the vault. So it's a lot more of the same, mowing down wannabe gangsters and taking combat slowly until we reach a room with a trigger man named Dino. We quickly take him out and help Valentine, the synth detective? Okay, I guess we aren't questioning it. We have help him escape and together we finish clearing out the vault of all the triggermen. When we go to leave the vault, we run into their boss, Skinny Malone, and end up just completely destroying him. Honestly, I thought this was going to be a hard fight, but using cover and vats liberally is really paying off. Moving on, we level up and take the perk Cap Collector, which helps us with prices when bartering. I think this will help a lot when we're looking to buy armor or if we just need a few extra caps for ammo. With that that settled, we leave the vault and travel with Nick Valentine all the way back to the detective agency. So before talking to Valentine again, I feel we need to get a few levels. We have managed to level up quite a bit so far, but I feel like power armor is going to be a must have for the late game content since I'm not going for a stealth build. For power armor to work, we need to boost our intelligence up to get the nuclear physicist perk and also need to start banking fusion cores. For this reason, I decided to go back and run a side quest. We go to the Cambridge Police Station station where we speak with Paladin Dance and his squad again. After being inducted into the Brotherhood of Steel as an initiate by Dance, we are told to report to Halen or Reese for an assignment. So I talk to Halen and she wants me to run to one of the locations in the Far Harbor DLC? What? Why in the world would that even be possible? Well, I hope Reese has a more reasonable request, let's see. Oh, he wants us to go clear ghouls out of a subway station nearby. Alright, this is one of those radiant quests that fall out for implemented and I'm not gonna cover it, we just go to the subway, kill some ghouls, and come back. Upon returning and turning the quest in to Night Reese, we are told to talk to Paladin Dance. When we do, he tells us to go off and find out what happened 
to the missing recon team that came before his, as well as telling us how to find them. We head off in the direction of the quest marker before eventually reaching a destroyed house with a dead Brotherhood Knight wearing a suit of power armor. A holotape on him mentions a nearby military base, so we go there and find some automated defenses and ghouls that we quickly make short work of. Inside, we find more ghouls, and what's this? A legendary? Awesome! Maybe we could get a legendary pipe weapon! Oh no. It's a shotgun. Oh well, good for selling at least. We find another dead Brotherhood member who has a holotape mentioning a satellite array across the street. Convenient! We head over there and find it swarming with super mutants and oh boy was this a fun fight. This is the first fight where I've died multiple times attempting it. I am super glad that I decided to sleep in the military base cause it saved me a ton of time. We ended up having to spend most of the fight alternating between sniping from a long range and falling back to kill the mutants chasing us down. This fight is the reason I've been worried about ammo. We went from nearly 70 rounds of 308 ammo to 17, but it did show me how to approach these harder fights without power armor. I need to use the bolt action rifle as much as possible since it has the highest damage per shot, and if things get close, I can unload the pipe rifle or pipe revolver into them to DPS the targets. Also, I'm super happy that I got Critical Banker because it's been a godsend. Either way, we eventually struggle our way through the super mutants and find, get this, yet another dead Brotherhood member. This time the holotape sends us to a bunker up north and after killing some gunners we manage to open the door to the bunker and find Paladin Brandis. For once Paladin he's Brand. a living Brotherhood member and we give him the holotags of his fallen squad members. After taking everything of value from his bunker, since he told us we could, we run back to Cambridge Police Station, tell Dance about everything we found and he gives us some caps and we have completed the quest. With that, we reached level 14, which is good, but there's one more place I'd like to go before getting back to Detective Valentine, the Boston Public Library in the city. We can find the intelligence bobblehead there, so I set off towards the city once more. Arriving at the library, I found a legendary ghoul outside, and oh hell yes, we got ourselves a legendary bolt action pipe rifle with the incendiary effect. This means every shot will deal 50 more fire damage to the enemy. I can't wait to take this thing back to the Red Rocket and kit it out, but first things first. We enter the library using a really funny line of dialogue that I'm gonna play for you now. The library is currently closed. I work here. Let me in. Please provide your six-digit employee ID number. My ID number is, um, one, two, three, four, five, Six. Welcome, Mr. Mayor. Please enjoy your visit. After that, we make our way into a room behind a barricade with friendly protectrons and turrets, and in this room, we find the intelligence bobblehead. But as soon as we pick it up, a huge wave of super mutants attacks. We help the robots defend against them, and even end up killing two legendary super mutants that unfortunately drop nothing useful for us. Either way, we leave the library, and for the sake of this video's length, I'm going to skip telling you all of the prep stuff we did and get right to arriving at Valentine's Detective Agency. So we're back in Diamond City. Let's take stock of what we have, starting with decked out versions of all three types of pipe weapons, including the legendary we just got. We have a fully repaired suit of T-45 power armor. We are level 16 and we are ready to get into the main storyline once again. Oh, and if you're enjoying this video, you should go down below and subscribe. All right, let's go to Valentine and see what he can do to help us find Sean. He interviews us about the kidnapping of Sean and eventually decides the best thing to do is investigate some dude named Kellogg. We head over to his old abandoned house and can't get in, so I head up to the mayor's office, fail an easy speech check, only to exceed the hard speech check because I'm a pro gamer. This gives us a key to the house and we go inside, look through his stuff, find out he's really into cigars and beer, and use that information to call dog meat to track him. So, I had the option to leave Valentine behind, and I don't know, do you all think that bringing him means I failed the run? I don't really think so, since I gave him a pipe weapon to use and he was using my ammo, so technically all the damage was done by pipe weapon. But if this invalidates the run, I guess having dog meat earlier did, and helping dance did as well. For this run, I'm gonna say it doesn't invalidate it, but let me know down in the comments what you think. Either way, we then followed dog meat across the way 
wasteland fighting trivial things like ghouls and yaogwai, but nearly dying to something like mole rats. Yeah, couldn't have made that one up. Eventually, we follow Dogmeat to a place called Fort Hagen. After dealing with some pesky home security turrets placed on the roof of Fort Hagen, we make our way inside to find more turrets and synths. I'm really glad I decided to go grab our power armor, because I think this fight would have been absolute hell if I didn't. There are so many enemies and so many nooks and crannies, and they're just coming out of the woodwork. It really made it easier to be able to take those extra hits. Either way, we eventually make our way down into the depths of this Fort Hagen complex and find Kellogg. After talking to him for a bit and finding out Sean is in the Institute, he says that the conversation is over, which is a really bad thing to say to someone you know you're about to fight, because it gives them a chance to use their two banked crits on you immediately, and that kills you. Oh well, we leveled up and I took the second rank of better criticals. Our crits do hella damage now. With Kellogg dead, we talk to Valentine and he says we need to go talk to Piper, that reporter we met going into Diamond City. So, uh, guess we're doing that now. So I tell him I'll meet him there and head outside to see a huge Zeppelin flying overhead and it's the Pridwin. Man, do the Brotherhood of Steel know how to make an entrance and I still find this sequence really epic and lovely. But there ain't no rest for the wicked. Yeah, yeah, I'll see my style. I, I wrote that in my script and for some reason doing the voiceover, I just couldn't resist trying to sing the song. We have to head back to Diamond City, so see you there. Or maybe we won't, because on the way back to Diamond City, I decided to check out the Cambridge Police Station. And I think it's about as good a time as any that we talk about which faction we're going to side with. I plan to side with the Brotherhood of Steel because on survival difficulty, you cannot fast fast travel, which is quite the struggle. The Brotherhood of Steel offers a solution though. The Vertibird Smoke Grenade, which lets us travel via Vertibird across the wasteland, which is admittedly worse than fast travel, but much faster than any other travel in the game. They also have their drawbacks. They aren't free, they are expensive, so we won't get very many, but the few we do get can be used to speed up things like traveling across the map, say when we need to go back to the Red Rocket to do some upgrades. So we run to the Cambridge police station to join the authoritarian flying metal men. After riding a vertebrate across the city and docking at the Pridwin, we watch Elder Maxon give an indoctrination, I mean inspiring speech to some of the members of the Brotherhood. Also, on a side note, throughout this run, the dialogue has been glitching out with a lot of NPCs cutting themselves off like Preston did. It's a bit odd, and I haven't seen it happen before, but I'll have to look into it after after this run is over. We talk to Maxon and the other important people on the Pridwind, including a really funny medical exam with the ship's doctor. Third question, and please answer honestly. Have you ever had sexual relations with any species considered non-human? Well, there was this one really ugly girl in college. I mean, I had to get drunk and it was a dare and ugh. That hardly qualifies, so I'll just put no. Before accepting a mission to go liberate some nukes from some super mutants, we go trade with the ship's quartermaster to get a few pieces of combat armor and just in general stock up on ammo before grabbing our Brotherhood issued set of power armor, which is T60 much better than our T45. We then go to board the Vertibird so we can go fight the super mutants and wait, where's the Vertibird? What? I was really confused because the vertebrate is usually docked to the Pridwin, but went down to the airport to find it sitting in a field. Oh well, we board the vertebrate and somehow Dance teleports to it? That's weird. Well, either way, we make our way over to the fort and I used the minigun to kill the super mutant behemoth so the bird could land. Huh, that's not a pipe weapon. Hmm. Can I not join the Brotherhood because of this mission? Damn. Well, I have one more option. Let's try walking over to Fort Strong and just skipping boarding the vertebrate. And it worked. 
So we begin slogging through the fight with the behemoth and all these super mutants, and it's really difficult compared to a lot of the fighting we've done. Dance even kind of went down for a little bit. Eventually, through clever use of a dilapidated building, we managed to deal with all of the super mutants outside, and really, the power armor is the hero there. I couldn't have survived nearly as many hits without the power armor, so I'm really happy we have a nice set now. We head inside and manage to kill all the super mutants relatively easily inside. Even a legendary thanks to a good crit, but then we go downstairs and I die almost immediately to a super mutant with a missile launcher. So I have to go back and fight through the behemoth and the first level of super mutants again, but this time I decided to save up a crit to use on the missile mutant. It kills him in one shot and allows us to clear the rest of Fort Strong without much issue. After this we have to go back to the Pridwin and speak with Elder Maxon, and he gives us 8 of the most important items to this run those being the vertebrate signal grenades. With these, we can now go back to the red rocket and upgrade gear, or get to quest areas so much faster. Now, it's time to go back to Valentine and Piper to continue the main storyline and find a way into the Institute, and we also leveled up. I took the second rank of nuclear physicist, which I don't remember if I told you, but I did take the first one, and fusion cores now last 50% longer. When we meet up with Nick, I decide to get my pipe gun and ammo back from him. While I do plan to have a companion run around with me using one of my pipe weapons, I don't want it to be Nick since I think he will be attacked on site by Brotherhood members. So we make our way back to Piper's place and talk to her about what happened with Kellogg. And I have to say, this entire section of the story, like this entire act of it, has some great sarcastic lines. We can talk to him. Feel like holding a seance? Yeah, if only. That old Merc's brain just might have all the secrets we need to know. I'm gonna need a really sharp ice cream scoop. I'm sure you'll manage. After talking for a bit and being all sassy, we end up on a plan to go to the settlement called Good Neighbor, where we can talk to a Dr. Amari at a place called the Memory Den. After sassing this Dr. Amari a bunch... Doctor, it's time for you to reverse death itself. What? You don't realize that the memory simulators require intact living brains to function. I mean, technically the corpse was defiled already. Do you have it with you? Could you say that like Dr. Frankenstein? Ego, fetch me the brain. We plug a piece of Kellogg's brain into Nick and watch his life story through some kind of memory reliving chair. After finding out the Institute uses teleportation in order to travel to the Commonwealth, we wake up, crack some jokes with Amari, Next time I have to watch someone's life story, I want popcorn. What? And go to talk to Nick, who sounds like Kellogg. Nick. Hope you got what you were looking for inside my head. <laughs> that was right. I should have killed you when you were on ice. You want to try for round two? Let's go! What? What are you talking about? I know this doesn't go anywhere, but when I first played the game, I was hoping they would play on this idea a lot more, but it seems like something that was put in with plans that never really came to fruition. Either way, we leave the Memory Den on a mission to find some rogue institute scientist named Virgil. He is in the Glowing Sea, which is an irradiated wasteland located where the bomb landed in the pre-war section of the game. I decided to head back to the Red Rocket, upgrade my pipe weapons one more time and grab my power armor before riding a vertebrate to Fort Hagen as it's the closest we can get to the glowing sea right now. On the way there, I noticed that we leveled up, so I took the second rank of Lone Wanderer to get the increased carry capacity and damage reduction. Okay, so we are at the glowing sea and it is quite the place. There are a lot of high level and dangerous enemies in the glowing sea, so I decided to make sure I found a bed before entering so if we die, it's not too horrible to travel again. We travel through the glowing sea, avoiding fights until we reach the crater created by the nuclear bomb, where we find some members of a cult called the Children of Adam who tell us that Virgil is in a cave nearby. We go talk to Virgil and he's a super mutant? That's strange. He does eventually explain that he forced himself to become a super mutant to survive the glowing sea, and long story short, in order to get to the institute, we need to find a courser, a super 
super powerful synth and kill it. So we grab the next vertebrate to the Cambridge police station and make our way towards the CIT ruins where we track a radio signal to find a building called Green Tech Genetics. And when we enter, we find an all out war going on inside, explosions and gunfire. It seems that the gunners, a group of raiders who use military tactics and gear, are trying to kill the courser we are after. Well, they don't play nice. So we end up battling through an entire army of them, it feels. It's slow and they are actually pretty well geared, forcing me to use more health supplies than I have in any other point. But we do eventually make it to the top floor and are able to meet up with the courser as he's interrogating some gunners. We open up by using a banked crit with our legendary bolt action pipe rifle and I immediately realize this battle is going to be hard. He uses a stealth boy, so we run away and hide. After playing peekaboo for a while, we manage to win the fight and get the courser chip as well as level up taking the second rank of Critical Banker. We then go and off the synth that the Courser was trying to capture, because no synths are allowed in the Brotherhood. Ad Victorium, brother! Yeah, that was dumb. Probably funnier in my head. Either way, we do a sick superhero jump off the top of the building and, uh, I don't know where we are going? I have a quest marker, but no idea where we are actually going, so we'll cut to when I'm there, I guess. While we make our way there, you should go down below and leave a comment suggesting what challenge I should attempt next. And it seems we had to go back to Dr. Omari. Uh, makes sense, I guess. We sass her some more and she tells us to go find the railroad. So we make our way to the Old North Church and use this decoder ring to spell railroad and meet their leaders. This is a really crappy security system. Like, it's like using your username as your password. Who wouldn't figure this out? Either way, we have the Courser chip decoded and we go back to Virgil, who tells us to build some technological mumbo jumbo. So we grab a vertebrate to the Pridwin, talk to Maxon, and for some reason he repeats a speech he gave us earlier? I didn't think he was that old, but the Brotherhood Elder is forgetting things. We then talk to Proctor Ingram, and she says she needs some specific materials and send us off to fetch them, so we go off and do that. It's just clearing some dungeons so we can get some random specific crafting materials, so I won't bother with the details, and eventually we do end up building this signal into Interceptor at the airport and talk to Maxon who tells us that inside the Institute we need to convince a scientist called Madison Lee to return to the Brotherhood. And with that we tell Ingram to fire up the relay and get teleported inside the Institute. We quickly throw a holotape into a computer terminal to scan their network for the Brotherhood before going further inside the facility when a man named Father starts talking to us on the intercom. After a long speech we find Sean and try and convince him to come with us, but Sean just gets more and more freaked out as any kid who is being kidnapped by a stranger should, until Father comes into the room and reveals that the young Sean is a synth, and he is in fact the real Sean. After some sassing, God, all we're missing are the teacups and the, the white rabbit. He tells us to go talk to a bunch of the Institute leaders, so we run around to the leaders of various departments, eventually ending with Dr. Lee. Convenient! So we try and convince her to come back to the Brotherhood, but it fails, so she asks us to find out what happened to Virgil. Man, if she only knew. So we agree and do as she asks, going into an abandoned part of the Institute's bioscience division. And we die immediately to a legendary assault tron on our first attempt. Hmm. Oh well, we go for round two, this time realizing we have a level up available, and we take rank two of Action Boy for better action point regeneration, before going in and killing a ton of turrets this time and a regular Assault Tron. In case you didn't know how legendaries spawn, it's pretty simple. Each time you load into a zone, there is a chance for any enemies in that zone to be a legendary. The chance goes up with difficulty levels and the player level. So this time we got lucky and didn't have to deal with a legendary Assault Tron. So with the lab cleared out, we get a holotape and a serum from it. We then take the holotape back to Lee and she agrees to come back to the Brotherhood. We then go talk to Father, who asks us to help a courser catch a rogue synth. Seeing as I don't want to pursue the Institute ending, I'm going to ignore that and return to Maxon. To leave the Institute, Father had Lee give us a courser chip on our Pip-Boy. So you would guess that we could just pull up our Pip-Boy and teleport out of the Institute anywhere we want, right? 
right? Oh, no, 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 no. That would make too much sense. We can only teleport back to the CIT ruins, despite the fact that we see sense teleport all across the Commonwealth. And this would have been an awesome perk for survival playthroughs. Bethesda, in their infinite wisdom, decided that on survival, going with the faction that has literal teleportation is worse than guys with a zeppelin. Ah! Either way, once we exit the Institute, we head over to the airport and give Ingram the network scanner holotape before reporting to Maxon about Dr. Lee. He then sends us back to Ingram, who opens a door to show us everyone's favorite weapon against communism, Liberty Prime. Then she tells us to go back up to the Pridwin and talk to Lee since she is refusing to work. Why? This back and forth made no sense to me. I guess this is for people who do things in a weird order. Either way, we do convince Lee to help with Liberty Prime and go back down to Proctor Ingram to be told we need to go find a high-powered magnet to get Liberty Prime online again. Man, the fetch quests are getting old already. We run off to the hospital and do that after taking rank one of the Life Giver perks since we leveled up from completing a few quests, and we return with the high power magnet. We then make the electromagnetic actuators for Liberty Prime and are told to head to the glowing sea to get some nukes for Liberty Prime's backpack, which actually sounds fun, so I guess I don't mind this fetch quest. Since we are going somewhere quite dangerous, I decided to grab Dance and give him a pipe weapon with a ton of ammo. We head outside and grab a vertebrate to meet up with Scribe Halen on the outskirts of the Glowing Sea. We get there, and it's beautiful chaos. Super mutants blowing up vertebrates and Brotherhood members fighting against them. It's great! After the battle, we talk to Halen, and she gives us a distress pulsar and sends us into the sea. We run into a few rad scorpions that scare the bejesus out of me, but eventually make it to the sentinel site, which is infested with ghouls. We kill them without any issue, but then run across one of those children of Adam, who for some reason won't let us take the bombs? I mean, it doesn't really make sense. He wants division, which is nuclear annihilation, and we want to use the bombs. He should just give it to us. So we blow his head off, but in a cruel twist of fate, Paladin Dance gets us killed. He sits here his big metal ass in the doorway, blocking me from heroically running away, so I ended up running through the entire glowing sea a few more times because I kept dying on the way there. Eventually though, I make it all the way back to this damn child of Adam and his Assaultron. The Assaultron's called Adam's Wrath, and I just decide to be safe and put two banked crits into it and run behind Dance before continuing to shoot it. We win the fight and sleep in the man's sleeping bag before using his terminal to open the door to the nuke storage, and Dan says he needs to stay behind, so we reload the save, grab my pipe rifle back, and then head to the elevator to leave, and oh my god, it's a glowing one ghoul. I nearly shit myself running away to the nuke storage room. We manage to kill it, and I sigh in relief as I ride the elevator back up, and oh, for the love of... I get jump scared again by a legendary blood bug and its entire family. I manage to deal with it and then call a vertebrate to pick up what's left of my nervous system and take me back to the Pridwin, screw the glowing sea. Once we're back, we talk to Proctor Ingram and Dr. Lee to find out that the fetch quests are over? Maybe? I don't know, seems kinda sus. Well, here we go. Ingram is going to let me hit the big red button to turn on Liberty Prime. Wait, did Lee just say that this needs to be done by a trained technician? Would be better if a trained technician performed that task, but... I suppose you deserve to be the one to do it. W why? It's literally pressing a red button. It's not like anyone can unpress said button. Why would it matter who hit it? I don't understand the logic, and that line felt like it was just added to make her sound smarter, but in reality makes her sound really, really dumb. Either way, we hit the button and Liberty Prime comes to life, and damn is it beautiful. Now that we have the iron giant of freedom and democracy on our side, I think we're pretty close to the end of the game, and I'm excited. Ingram tells us to head up to the Pridwin and talk to Maxon, so let's go do that. He opens up super aggressively towards us and grills us about Dance being a synth. Is there anything you wish to tell me, Knight? After talking in circles with him, he gives us orders to go kill Dance. Man, this sucks. I really like Dance. 
We go to Proctor Quinlan looking for leads when Scribe Halen barges in angrily. Man, everyone's on edge right now. Either way, she eventually tells us where Dance is on the condition that we hear him out. So we make our way to a bunker that he's hiding out in and kill his security turrets and protectrons. Then we speak to him, he becomes adamant that we need to follow Maxon's orders, so after a heartbreaking chat, we take our trusty legendary bolt action rifle and put a round between his eyes. Hopefully, a fitting death for a man as great as him. We then return to the Pridwin, get promoted to Paladin to fill Dance's shoes, and get his power armor. Hot damn does this power armor look great though. Back to some cheery violence, we go speak to Captain Kells and he tells us it's time to go murder the railroad. Oh boy, this is gonna be great. Time to grab a vertebrate and head out to church because it's Sunday and rapture is coming for those synth sympathizers. We arrive at the church and immediately there's fighting going on and the Brotherhood are losing quite badly. We battle through the church pews, killing off the railroad on the main floor with only minor struggles. Before delving into the crypts where fighting surprisingly got a lot easier, mostly thanks to lucky RNG, because we got a legendary Brotherhood knight and the railroad got no legendaries, which is really rare considering how late we are into the game. Anyways, we fight all the way to the entrance of their HQ, then blow the door to it open. A bunch of railroad are waiting on the other side, but we manage to get through them with a little bit of resistance, and we enter the HQ. Once inside, I'm worried because I'm basically alone, and I know Glory has a minigun. So I run in and kill Drummer Boy before Glory comes running up with a minigun, and I decide to valiantly run back into the catacombs to see if they would follow me out so I could fight them with help. But they didn't. So I popped some healing meds and medics for damage resist and went back in. This time using banked up criticals to kill Glory, then it got weird. Random railroad members kept picking up the minigun, so I kept having to prioritize which one was holding the minigun, and after a while of ducking in and out of what little cover I had, I managed to eliminate all the railroad members and reprogram their robot named PAM, or PAM for short, to go back to the Pridwin. With that, I returned to the Pridwin myself and reported to Captain Kells, who praised us for our work and sent us to Ingram. Ingram tells us we need to go get some gizmo from the Mass Fusion building and that she is coming along. And I just remembered that this mission is one of those ones where they throw you on a vertebrate and expect you to use the minigun. I'm now worried that I've wasted hours only to find out that I have to switch factions at the 11th hour. This could be bad, but let's see what happens if I just never fire the minigun. And it went fine. Eventually the vertebrate takes enough damage and the pilot says he's going to hot drop us. Cool. So we end up on the roof surrounded by synths. This sounds bad, but in reality, it's not me trapped up here with the synths. It's the synths trapped up here with me. So we make easy work of them. Moving on, we find out the gizmo has been moved from the top of the building to underneath it. So we take the elevator down until the synths blow power to it. So we have to get off and kill a bunch of synths before we turn the power back on and finally reach the reactor level. It's here that we grab the gizmo from the reactor core, which is extremely dangerous. Even in good power armor, my radiation was going up quick. Oh, also, when we grabbed the gizmo, it triggered the building's security, so we run back out and have to fight a sentry bot immediately. Well, fight is a strong word. We more so have a staring contest with it until it died. And then two assault trons come out, and thankfully, they target Proctor Ingram. Oh, did I mention that she came along? Well, she did. After those are dealt with, we make our way out of the reactor level by killing some turrets and a protectron, and make it to the main floor once more. Man, was this section fun though. I ran into a side room and found a terminal that would activate all the turrets and protectrons on this floor, and totally used it. Immediately, the turrets and protectrons were hostile to both us, the Brotherhood of Steel who showed up to try and help get us out, and the synths. So there's this huge battle with tons of lasers of different colors flying around, and we mostly hid inside an elevator because I'm not dying and doing this entire section again. But I do love the chaos I created and think it deserves to be mentioned. Once all the enemies are slain, we level up and take the third rank of Life Giver, allowing us to regenerate HP slowly when out of combat. That should help us use a lot less stim packs. We then make our way outside and 
back to the airport to finally power up Liberty Prime for good. After putting the gizmo in his back and hitting the big red button again, Liberty Prime comes to life and starts a rampage through the city towards the CIT ruins. We follow him, and I know this sequence gets railed on by a lot of people, but I like it. Sure, we aren't doing much just walking behind him and watching him kill things, but it's nice to see this big old America robot kick some ass. So, I approve. After we reach the ruins, we have to defend Liberty Prime while it searches for a way into the Institute. Then, we get to watch its face laser melt through the ground and open up a hole which we promptly jump through. The fighting inside the Institute is tough and slow, but through careful use of cover, vats, and a convenient sentry bot, we make it through the old robotic section unscathed and into the bioscience section. There's not much to note here except this really funny moment when Elder Maxon gets absolutely styled on by a no-name synth. I was laughing when I saw it happen, and it's little moments like these that bring joy into my life. Once we exit the bioscience section, we have probably the second hardest fight of the final mission in the hub of the Institute. We get lucky and are able to one-shot the only legendary synth that spawned, but it was definitely tense for a bit. We then have to go up and talk to Sean and turn off a facility shutdown using his computer. After a nice chat with our son, who is older than us, we blow out his brains and release the facility shutdown so we can progress towards the Institute's reactor. We make decent progress until we make it into the reactor room where I nearly crap myself when a legendary synth shoots a missile at me. Luckily he missed and I just fell back and hid behind the Brotherhood NPCs and let them handle it. Cowards live, heroes die. Moving on, we clear out the reactor room and place a nuke inside the reactor itself before teleporting out. The synth version of Child Sean wants to go with us, but I've already committed to being a Brotherhood member, so I leave him. We teleport out, press a big red button, and see a very pretty explosion while answering the question, can I beat Fallout 4 survival with only pipe weapons? Yes, yes I can. Thank you all so much for watching, and if you enjoyed, please consider liking, subscribing, and sharing it to your friends. This is my first challenge video, so any constructive criticism would be great. Thank you to my Patreons who support my work, and make sure you stay beautiful, everyone.